So back when I was trying to decide which seminary I would attend, I decided to make appointments with all of the directors of admissions at these places, um, one of which was the director of admissions, uh, Anastasia Kidd, at Boston University School of Theology, just an incredible woman who happened to also be an ordained Methodist minister, Reverend Dr. Anastasia Kidd. And I remember so clearly sitting in her office on Commonwealth and asking her that day that how in the world it was that she, a minister, ended up in the admissions office. <laughs> And she told me that her call to ministry was all about companioning others in and through their call to ministry. She described it as ministering to people as they cross, crossed the thresholds, plural, for there were for sure a few. She then told me about students at the School of Theology who she had companioned across the first threshold, which was kind of where I was, then returning to her office, usually around the end of the first year or so, being in the middle of what she called a total crisis of faith. That's the second threshold, according to Reverend Anastasia. Now, for some context, it takes three years to get a Master's of Divinity, which is what is required to be ordained into the clergy, if you go full-time and stay on schedule. So take that in. About a third of the way in, one year of classes, crisis of faith. Now, when I heard this, I thought two things. The first was, this is the seminary for me. And that did become my seminary. I mean, isn't this what you want to be around in seminary? It's what I wanted to be around, people grappling with matters of faith. I don't really know how you serve people grappling with their faith if you aren't really familiar with the myriad of ways that this can happen. And I definitely wanted to be a part of a community that was thrumming with this kind of grappling. So I guess this says something about my particular brand of ministry. So my decision to go to BU School of Theology, this Methodist seminary over the other choices I had was made then and there. So that was the first thing. And the second thing I thought, and you might th think this really strange, but this is genuinely what came into my mind. I want a crisis of faith. I, it's just what, it's true. I mean, on paper, it sounds kind of refreshing. Like, is it possible that everything I believe in might just get totally turned on its head in like a year? Like, what? And I'm going to be honest with you. There's some hubris in there. Like, oh, what a surprise that would be. That couldn't possibly <laughs> happen to me because I'm a Unitarian Universalist. And crises of faith, oh, those are things that bring you people out there, out there to us. <laughs> Not the other way around. There I go, poking another hole in our UU exceptionalism. I said that last week. I'm so sorry. It's just the beginning of the year, and I've only gotten started. Oh, no. Well, this is not a story with any good twists. It would be a horrible detective novel, because you'd know where this is going. I did have a complete crisis of faith. And it arrived around the same time as everyone else's, which was really humbling. And it wasn't a conversion to any other faith, nothing like that. 
It was more a time of realizing that most of what I had staked, staked, my dearly loved and what felt like oh so steady beliefs in about God, all of the sacred texts that I lived my life by and it really saved me in the rooms of recovery, they just didn't hold up anymore by September of that second year. The theology, the gender that I realized my God was, he, and what I'd been taught to believe about being a spiritually whole person. None of it held up anymore for me. And it wasn't any one class or a singular thing that happened that got me there. It was just this slow shift, and it was right around the beginning of that second year that I just found myself believing in nothing and questioning everything. And for those of you who know that feeling, it's awful. It felt lonely, it was disorienting. None of the spiritual practices that I was, had been leaning on, the ones that kept me joyful and balanced, they didn't work, and I didn't have any new ones, so I was just a really unhappy, angry, unbalanced person. Yep, that is what my crisis of faith felt like. And thanks to people like Reverend Anastasia, I spent that next year and a half or so just trying to not rush it. We want to rush stuff like this. Quickly supplant beliefs with new beliefs, find answers so that we don't have to live in the nebulousness of the questions. Or do everything we can, here's one that I can default to, everything we can to find quick, fast food fixes for happiness. Speaking of recovery rooms, there are a lot of them out there now trying to help people learn to live without these quick fixes. Another word that people are using for this these days is called spiritual bypassing. Oh, I know that one. The Greek word metanoia metanoia, is uttered 75 times in the Gospels. Every time it is spoken, it arrives in the form of a wisdom teaching in response to a really big question that the people, even the apostles, would consistently be asking Jesus how to be how to be with one another, how do we live, what do we believe, how do we believe? Metanoia, metanoia. Right. Now our English Bibles have got this word stated as repent. Now we all think of what we think of when we hear repent, let it go. Do you know what metanoia's precise translation is? Change your mind. Change your mind. How do we live? Change your mind. What will become of us? Stay in the orientation of change your mind. How do we follow God? Be willing to change your mind. How do we believe in God? Be willing to change your mind. How do we love one another or our enemies? Change your minds. Change your minds. Turn, turn, open, change. 
Father Richard Rohr, who has taught me most of what I know and love about Christianity and the Bible, he wrote a short piece called, To Live is to Change. And he begins this way. Here below, to live is to change. And to be perfect is to have changed often. Father Rohr says, now that's a very different philosophy than most of us have. Our natural approach is to keep it in cruise control. The way we do it is the way we do it is the way we do it. But if we don't grow, if we don't change, he says, we end up the same at 70 as we were at 17. And he says, we all know people like that. And they aren't very fun to live with. If people refuse to change what his mother used to call bullheadedness, the world will only get worse. Jesus, he says, teaches us to change our minds so that we might know the true meaning of heaven on earth. Jesus had a similar ministerial call as Reverend Anastasia, the director of admissions at the School of Theology. Threshold ministry, threshold ministry, companioning people through the great mind change. And you know, this is Unitarian Universalism's call too. Not just for those who arrive to us, but also those who have been here their whole lives. Change your mind. Be open to seeking, changing, growing, wondering, turning. And the Christian theology of change, which is where our Unitarian Universalist faith began, this theology of change, it takes its cues from the earth-based traditions which preceded it. Ancient indigenous civilizations, which every one of our ancestors were a part of somewhere in the world, drew their wisdom and theologies from the natural world, what the plants were doing, what the animals were doing, what the sun, moon, stars, the motions of celestial bodies were doing, weather, seasons, and these were named by turnings, turnings of the wheel marked by, I was just talking about it with Lynn here, Stone circles, stone circles, right? That tracked them, is what we think, right? That tracked them some, somehow, how they made sense of the turnings of life with which they were apart, outside and my friends inside, you see. There was no difference, no difference. So yes. The theology of change was what they were about, too. And as Charlene mentioned, today is the autumn equinox. It's one of eight wheel turns in the pagan tradition, which takes its cues from many of these ancient indigenous earth traditions. So right now, all of us right now are literally sitting on a threshold. It's not summer not quite fall, it's both, it's neither. Life all around us, and I don't want to pretty this up for you, I'm not, it's dying in its variety of ways. It has to, so that something new can be born. We love our Bright yellow, red, and orange fall leaves, it's my favorite time of the year. Honestly, they are so beautiful. Go deeper. And you know that they are dying. And they are beautiful. As the days get shorter, the trees don't have enough sunlight to make food for themselves. Rather than struggle to make food through the winter, they shut down and stop producing chlorophyll. And they let those leaves go and die, and in the dying, the colors are just so beautiful. 
Those who ritualize this particular wheel turning know that this is a time for interior mirroring. mirroring. Do you get that? Loosen, let go, make way for the new, and know it is beautiful, my friends. Change is beautiful, harsh, but beautiful. To live is to change. Now, the last two weeks I have said to you, the stakes are so high. The words on that sorrow card, I am enraged. The stakes are so high. You know this. And not unlike Jesus' time, amid such high stakes, most people are stuck. That's why the stakes are so high. That's why most of us are so utterly enraged by stuck people. And sometimes it's us. Those who refuse to change. Stuck in ideologies, stuck in polarizing political camps, stuck in individualism, stuck in the past, stuck in the future, stuck in their trauma, blame, hatred, fear, stuck in mistrust, stuck in cynicism, stuck in belief, stuck in apathy, stuck in non-belief. They, we, can't let die what needs to die. Mourn it properly, however it once served you, helped you along for a time, and then let it go, and then, oh, the weight that I was talking about earlier. Thank God I had wise owls around me to teach me about the weight. Can't do this stuff alone. Wait like those leafless trees in the winter, right? and stop fighting what is trying to be made new. And I know we humans, I do, I fight this cycle because it's, it's change is really frightening. And the unknown, is, it, it is terrifying. I get it. And so most of us are stuck. And there are so many places in my being that I am stuck to. But if we stay with the image of the wheel that must turn, right? We, I mean, we certainly find ourselves alarmed when our seasons don't turn. So let's agree that we agree it should turn. Isn't it the same for us? So today's equinox, it, it does, it offers us an invitation. Every wheel turning does. And that's our month's theme, invitation. It's just one of many sacred texts for na nature, certainly is a sacred text. Inspiration that we have at our fingertips. Something that is calling us toward a higher, much, much higher wisdom about our hearts and our minds and our lives and our bodies and our relationships. A series of ebbs and tides, movements and stillnesses, thresholds, upon thresholds, to again return to Christian theology, here we go, symbolic births and deaths and resurrections. That's what it's all about. It's symbolism of mind, body, and spirit. And by the way, birth, death, and resurrection also draws from our earth-based theologies about life, death, and regeneration. That's how they put it the natural and healthy, well-oiled cycle of all things, outside and inside. That's what we're going for. Well-oiled wheels moving around between those three. And this, by the way, is what that crisis of faith led me towards. The ancient goddess civilizations whose worldview was all about life, death, and regeneration. All was in motion. Metanoia, metanoia, to live is to change. That was it for me. I want us to return to our poet's wisdom, having said what I have said.
three times my life has opened by Jane Hirschfield. Three times my life has opened. Once into darkness and rain. Once into what the body carries at all times within it and starts to remember each time it enters the act of love. Once to the fire that holds all. These three were not different. You will recognize what I am saying, or you will not. But outside my window, all day a maple has stepped from her leaves like a woman in love with winter dropping the colored silks. Neither are we different in what we know. There is a door, it opens, then it is closed, but a slip of light stays like a scrap of unreadable paper left on the floor, or the one red leaf the snow releases in March. To live is to change. And my friends, you are not alone. You are not alone. May you know this. May it be so. And amen. <laughs>